Good morning. I feel like we can do a little better than that for the Sunday sermon. Okay, so good morning. Thank you, thank you. I need your strength. Um, it's been a beautiful week. I'm so grateful to be here in the care and company of every black woman and ally here in this room. We are truly folded into the loop together. Before we get started, I want to riff a little and perhaps to say some loud parts out loud. In 2012, the brilliant Rashida Bumbre organized a truly major exhibition of the brilliant Simone Lee's work at The Kitchen in New York. As the first black executive director and chief curator of The Kitchen as an experimental avant-garde art institution in the 50 plus years of its existence, I'm saying this loud part out loud because a first is never first. Because celebrating sisterhood, this sisterhood that has spanned years and keeps blooming, is, as Sister Madeline Hunt Ehrlich reminded us in her exchange with Christina Sharp yesterday, an example of what black women deserve. As she reminded us, she said, black women deserve avant-garde extravagance. Yes. So, what I've had the honor of seeing over these past days keeps instructing. What is experimental and what black feminism instructs us towards is the imagination of abundance. Avant-garde histories, experimental histories, radical thought is made and remembered because no matter how tired we are, how much we have going on, we choose to extend our hand to one another. We choose to keep holding on. We heard from Miss Annette about the radical and avant-garde vision of the Order of the Tents. Rashida and Simone stand in that vision and legacy, a cosmic order in their own right. Their work at the kitchen, through and beyond it, keeps manifesting and shaping the possibility of this moment right now. So, starting with thanks, Simone, Rashida, Tina, Saidia, Rebecca, Susan, and all the phenomenal organizers who have gorgeously shaped and held this space, thank you. I also want to start this day with immense gratitude and holding space for you brilliant and courageous thinkers of Morehouse and Spellman. And the other folks, yes. And the other folks of the next generation in this room, I hope you know how much we see you, how much we feel you, and how much the future is ready for you. So to keep saying the loud part out loud, to circle the mission and work of the avant-garde and the work it does to defy boundaries, as we saw with Simone and Rashida's show in 2012. The experimental and the avant-garde would not exist without the contributions of blackness. But blackness as a technology would not have survived without the risk-taking innovations and strategic care systems of black feminist traditions. So I say this because as we begin, I want to call out to those who have come before us, to those who didn't make it, some of whom we know, and some of whom we may never know, and to begin these thoughts that follow by holding in love and spirit all the work they did to make this now possible. Those spirits are here too today. So let's get down to it. Bringing an experimental, eco-critical analysis of the loophole forward, I want to start with some quotes. Be not afeard. The aisle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. The clouds, methought, would open and show riches ready to drop upon me that when I waked, I cried to dream again. I am given to understand that whiteness is the ownership of the earth forever and ever. Amen. And then, of course, water is the first thing in my imagination. All beginning in water all ending in water. Turquoise, aquamarine, deep green, deep blue, ink blue, navy, blue, black, cerulean water. Reflecting on the thread of marinage and its relationship with the natural world, 
I thought it would be timely and necessary within the context of this particular forum, in a place like Venice, where we have arrived here by boat, where we are surrounded by water, where black sub-Saharan Africans were enslaved, and where, as a result of the history of black enslavement, there was, at one point, a presence of black gondoliers, to talk about the idea of independent communities that escaped slavery, as being those as our womanist ancestors escaped and resisted by continuing to live, to whom we are grateful, as without them we would not be here in this room together today. As an urgent part of this, I also want to turn to a tender community so as to not forget them, the sovereign community that chose to end their lives and in doing so, their independence in an anti-life, a feminist resistance in its own right, a bending into a form of failure that strategically cracked open other understandings of what it means to generate, this root of generation, the generation of individuals who keep calling out to us in the self-determination and self-governance of their own collective rebellion. So my presentation today is for the ones who didn't make it, to call on the words of Ntozake Shange, the colored girls, those, as Shange stated in 1976, might be, quote, on the other side of the rainbow, picking up the pieces of days spent waiting for the poem to be heard. Reflecting on how to grapple with the other side of the rainbow, I wanted to meditate with this Sunday morning congregation on the work of two artists in particular, the phenomenal Nadeline Pierre, whose work you see on the screen, and Firle Baez, whose work you'll see shortly. Nadeline will be in the first sequence and Firle thereafter. And a selection of their works that are brought together today. I spent so much time looking at the work of these two brilliant black women and have the joy and honor of being in dialogue with them over time. So I'm just going to go through some of the images. Circling back to each of them and their distinct perspectives, I wonder aloud with you today as we draw out another thematic thread, that of magical realism, what it might mean if each of these two bodies of work became portals to the other. What if, and perhaps next slide if someone can help me, great. What if Fearlay's tidal forces are showing us what a black celestial sight looks like? a fluid version of the heavens in flux. And what if, on the other hand, we register Nadeline's vision as perhaps revealing to us a loophole into a world that could exist beneath us, a space where heaven, earth, and sea bend and collapse to create new complex passageways. These groundbreaking paintings show us tears in space and time. Fearlay and Nadeline, respectively with their bodies of work, each allow us to imagine differently what a world should be and who can dream there. Today I want to travel there and hold an equal critical position for the spiritual and the supernatural. What healing possibilities can generate at the edge of catastrophe. As black women in a queered space, I want us to ask, perhaps, if we can agree that we have already survived the apocalypse. A, virgin, a version of a geologic end, as cited in the cartographic, social, cultural event, and geographic location of the Middle Passage. Are we living now in an afterlife? Can this help us be reminded of the innovations we are capable of? Can we get free? In the 1990s, Detroit-based electronic music duo, James Stinson and Gerald Donald, built their own mythology around an underwater, Afro-diasporic, sub-Atlantic civilization called Drexia. We heard a bit about this yesterday. The two performed under a moniker of the same name, engaging a fantastic feminist contra-imagination surrounding an undersea world, described by British Ghanaian writer, theorist, and filmmaker Kudwa Ashan as populated by the children of slaves who had been thrown overboard during the Middle Passage. In this science fiction, the female slaves who were thrown overboard did not die, but gave birth to children who could breathe underwater. Stinson and Donald thus made over the oceanic pathways of Mafa, visiting them not as a graveyard, but as a black utopia. Risen from the profundity of loss, 
elastic and agile in its creative potential. According to Ashan, quote, they used to imagine themselves in a submersible descending to the bottom of the ocean. The absolute depths, absolute silence, blackness, crushing pressure, the creaking of metal. They would think themselves into this space and then they would start making music from this perspective of insulation and isolation. We can consider then that it was perhaps there together in this submarine of networked black consciousness, incubated in insulation and isolation, that Drexia, the electronic music duo, first greeted the women of Drexia. Drexia in this moment became a burgeoning black feminist collective commune, imagined and determined through the brine to haunt towards resistance as they mourned and remade the world. What Alexander Wahelier calls the shifting forms of non-human otherworldliness, replacing the human as the central characteristic of black subjectivity, is represented by this tactical reinvention of diasporic journeying. It rejects a narrative of the fungibility of black objecthood and proffers new ways to move and to mobilize. This marine future fantasy bends sky and earth exists simultaneously in stark contrast and codependent dialogue with the practice of white captors and traders taking insurance out on the lives of enslaved people as they traveled through the Middle Passage and beyond. This perpetuated, strengthened, and advanced the framework of an economy that made chattel of human beings, thereby remaking the designation of human entirely, defined now by the oppressive constraints of a capitalist supremacy. Black people, were material assets to those who transported, owned, and sold them, to be capitalized on as valued goods. Assets circulated via sale and life, and assets collected on in death. The latter made literal via the practice of actively throwing underwritten insured bodies overboard in the journey across the Atlantic with the hopes of being compensated by claims filed by white slavers thereafter. Conversely, black people contemplating suicide on land and at sea became an Afro-pessimistic form of self-governance, rebellion and economic sanction. As an extension to this, black women performing infanticide, as visioned in Toni Morrison's 1987 novel Beloved, wherein protagonist Setha kills her daughter to protect her from the violence of enslavement, dictates a multivalent approach to a radical feminist futurity. Infanticide for the black woman within this history manifests a reproductive strike against the complex entanglement of white patriarchy and white dominion, wherein the black womb is itself ecocritically implicated, reimagined as a geopolitical site. In its reproduction, it is weaponized against itself. The womb, therefore, is transformed into a core engine to the machine of antebellum capitalism and its systems of anti-blackness, with nothing else left to control the control of one's own life, for a black subject becomes a tactical emancipation. This, too, is a tender and painful contribution to the retreat of our black feminism now. Derek Walcott, in his Sea is History, writes, quote, bone soldered by coral to bone, mosaics, mantled by the benediction of the shark's shadow. That was the Ark of the Covenant. Walcott reminds us that for Africans who went overboard by choice or by force, many were consumed by sharks. What this tells us is that marine life and black life have always been to call on the sticky terminology of Donna Haraway, companion species. As Alexis Pauline Gums reminds us, we are marine mammals. We are bound together by this grief. Black feminisms, womanisms, in their strategic refusal and mourning, have actually fueled ecosystems. This, too, is a complex intimacy I want us to hold space for, as it is a loophole of retreat. The hydro theory, then, of Stinson and Donald flips the script on the cataclysmic connotations of these histories, imbuing them instead with an empowered future vision. Their construction of a new myth of a Drexian race as an underwater nation and radical wombscape comprised of African women. Their children in regeneration, 
a resurrection and reparative afterlife that animates the dead and dying is an Afrofuturist twist too. This very impossibility, shaped into possible BA, articulates the generative remix and transcendent technology of the oral tradition of the black mythos and refuses the spatial necropolitic of the Middle Passage as a tectonic site. Within it, we see the embedded algorithmic coding and structural blueprint as established by the visionary work of black feminist organizing. Drexia symbolizing what the Kumbahi River Collective describes as, quote, an autonomous black women's movement. In their statement dated April 1977, the Kumbahi Collective observes, quote, if black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free. Since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all systems of oppression. What is remarkable then about Drexia as a proposal is that it alchemizes entirely the troubled world as it has been built around black women, but not for black women. The thought work folded into the impossibility of this underwater civilization turns the system of map making as an illustration and tool of conquering colonial coercion and control on its ear. This flip subverts alongside the false claims of landscape, so often gendered and feminized in accounts written by men for men, in a support of manifest destiny expressed by the imperialism of discovery as a vernacular of white delusion. It is a reckoning wherein we must ask here and now, are we living underwater? Is this our negotiation toward an ecstatic afterlife? The conditions of life, living, and the living for black people are so often predicated on the legacy of enslavement. As the early ontology of black life shaped and restructured by the supremacy of colonialism did not conceive of black people, much less black women, as living human beings, the radical restructure comes in our afterlife. It is a site of black counter-enclosure, congregation, and becoming. Continuing into today, black people are so often utilized as machines to advance a capitalist vision that in its very articulation of a successful future renders blackness and black womanhood extinct. For this reason, the historical relationship between human and machine is anxious and tense, constantly collapsing in on itself as it grapples with the task of reconciliation. To follow through the narrative begun by Stinson and Donald, perhaps then, if we are aqueous cyborgs, matrilineal descendants of human beings who shape-shifted to survive in lieu of defeat and decay. It is our existing on solid land, constrained by the supremacy of the landscape itself as a gendered, race, class, and failed locality and tradition that perhaps has created the collective condition of I can't breathe. This is embodied by the state-sanctioned social death and physical death alike. We can't breathe because existing on land rather than underwater in this futurist imagination defies the ways in which we've been re-engineered. Freedom then, and the destruction of all systems of oppression, becomes a task of remapping our bodies and the land we travel through, newly finding ways to blur and blend the logic of our earthboundedness instructed by the ways in which black women, royalty of Drexia, each of you in this room, innovated to make a life at sea possible. So this is why the work of Nadine Pierre and Fear Le Baez reminds us perhaps to think differently about our relationship to land and sea. A restructuring of the romanticism made manifest destiny by the likes of those within a movement such as the Hudson River School where outdoor painting or plain air becomes black feminist labor and GIS mapping by existing in and at the highest celestial point, or submerged within the darkest depths of the sea. Our plain air is between the stars and at zero gravity. Our plain air is awash in salt water. These are the vantage points that Nodlene and Fearle show us. They reframe American wilderness. They give us painterly pas passageways and portals, pushing back at a typhoon coming on. As Morgan Parker writes in her poem, Hot and Tot Venus, business is booming, and I am not loved. 
the way I want to be. I am technically nothing human. I will never be a woman. The loophole of black feminism requires us to revise human and woman, to remind ourselves that the new world for us has never been free, but that the conditions of freedom have always necessitated the ending of the world. Plunged into the womb of the water, suspended into outer space, all at the same time. Thank you.